Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the 15th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on September 13, 2020, are from Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. The semi-continuous first reading is Exodus 14, 19 through 31. Psalm 103, optional verses 1 through 7, and then 8 through 13, are our last reading from the book of Romans, chapter 14, verses 1 through 12, and Matthew, chapter 18, 21 through 35. And uh, you might have noticed, listeners, that uh, we are missing one of our podcasters. That's Joy, Jay Moore, and she's taking a little bit of time off as we move into the semester so we miss her but we will uh we will try to valiantly carry on without her happy new church year everybody yeah this is going to be a different rally sunday for people isn't it it better be yeah (laughs) it better be very Mm -hmm. different Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good joke, Matt. Uh, but it, it, this is really the start of our cultural new year. And as I said last week on the podcast, it's also nearing the start of the Jewish new year, which is actually this week. So interesting how our cultural new year actually kind of conforms to the Old Testament um, annual cycle. And the theme for that beginning of the new year, at least if you're paying attention to Matthew, seems to be forgiveness. So that's... uh, That's a good way to start the new year. It's a good way to start the new year. What brings us together, what allows us to stay together even in this weird time? Mm -hmm. Forgiveness. Mm -hmm. I have a new app on my phone about that. It's called Matthew 18 Sin Counter. And the app automatically counts the times that people sin against me. So that, it, and Caroline, you're up to like 75. So you only got two to go. <laughs> really? That's and We've it? known each other since 1990. <laughs> so that's pretty long. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know, one thing that's striking about, I mean, obviously Matthew is uh, longer and has uh, more general material uh, in his gospel, but I'm just um, I'm I'm just struck by the narrative space that's given to this. Uh, this I, what the importance of forgiveness and how critical it is. Going back to last week when we were talking about uh, communal discipline, discipline, and what does a community look like, and and talked about different hallmarks of what that what that means and how do we engage in community. And then here we have uh, here we have forgiveness as being an absolutely critical tenet of what Christian community looks like. And uh, and you know this we got a hint of this of course going back to the Sermon on the Mount uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the Lord's Prayer in chapter six fourteen and fifteen of forgiveness. And so it's it's not like you know Jesus just threw that out and said oh that's a good idea. We're coming back to this now um, as the community is going to imagine uh, how does it carry on in community uh, without Jesus present. And, um, and forgiveness is going to be a really key issue. So I think, you know, I think, uh, I think this will, I think it's a critical topic for people right now. And as you said, uh, Rolf, I mean, people are in oh, such different uh, places with so many things and, and sort of that call to forgiveness maybe is becoming a daily mantra um, when we think about the ways in which uh, so much of our world has um, gone through upheaval and the kinds of behaviors that we've anticipated or expected from people whom we know very, very closely are even different. And so how do we, how is it that forgiveness can be um, that, that reminder, that daily reminder that we need? And that is truly, uh, that truly is, again, a hallmark of Christian community, not retaliation, uh, not revenge, not vengeance, but forgiveness. Uh, and I think that's a message that people need to hear uh, and that people need to live. So what is forgiveness for both of you? How would you help people get a sense of what it is? Does the parable help? <laughs> you know, it's, 
That's really, I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's a good question. I, I go immediately back to like word studies from Hebrew um, for both what are the different metaphors for sin and uh, then what what is it, what are the metaphors and the verbs for um, forgiveness um, and, and then what are the uh, what, what metaphors make sense in our our context um, so one is uh, one is letting go uh, one metaphor verbal metaphor for forgiveness is letting go um, to let go of a sin against you, an offense, you know, that uh, a crime. Um, another is sort of erasure, and, and that's a modern one. It's, um, you know, to, to and, and, and you do get this in some of the parables uh, in Matthew, uh, the, uh, the metaphor of erasure, you know, uh, quickly write down this, you know, writing, you know, keeping account. So those two things kind of go together for me. And for when I've been able to forgive, um, not the little stuff, but some of the bigger stuff that I've needed to, I need to let go of it, um, primarily for the sake of the relationship, but also at a certain point for my own sake, you know? What about you, Matt? Or Caroline? What? Do you want to go, Caroline? Yeah, I think, uh, well, one thing that helped me think about it uh, was in the commentary about uh, about um, that Peter's question takes forgiveness out of the countable category and places it in the realm of the incalculable. Uh, calculable. Um, the way in which we are so prone to keeping tabs on uh, on how you know, how people have uh, harmed us or, uh, and, a, you know, a kind of um, a tit for tat kind of reality. And I think for me, that helped me think about that in terms of uh, that, that forgiveness is not just on these larger levels of of um, a, a major grievance, but also the ways in which uh, that the ways in which I, I subtly not forgive, <laughs> um, that, that kind of permeates into my life, you know, that I, uh, and, and that, that kind of called me to account to say, where, how is it that I daily actually uh, uh, hold, hold a grudge or how that I, that I feel like I've been harmed and, and maybe using the term that you use, Ralph, of letting go, but I just I, I began to realize it, particularly in the you know the uh, in the interaction with Jesus and Peter about the number, um, how much I tend to locate forgiveness in like these larger these larger events and how much it really is a part of your daily life. That was I don't that doesn't necessarily um, define it, but it made me realize that so much of it for me is about kind of this kind of tab keeping or score keeping of what I've done right and what somebody else has done wrong. Yeah, I liked the, the, the idea and the commentary by Audrey West of being in the incalculable, that part of forgiveness is, is, a, is a moving away from score keeping or accounting. I don't find this parable super helpful. I mean, it's a pretty simple parable in the sense of, you know, the magnitude of one act of forgiveness versus then what would, why would somebody who hasn't been forgiven so much then treat somebody else so harshly? I, I get that, but I don't like it when forgiveness is compared to debts uh, that are countable, that tend to have more of a zero sum, uh, where there's somebody takes a loss when there's a debt um, and I think the very, obviously the end of the parable is really disturbing. This idea of torturing somebody until he can repay 10,000 talents is a little absurd. But then that final line, my heavenly father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive from your heart. Most people are going to hear that, I think. I hear that and wonder, what does it mean to forgive from my heart as opposed to just saying, I forgive you. But that, because some sins are very difficult to forgive that deep down. Um, some transgressions are not healthy to ignore when they are that 
deep down or that puts you into real danger. So ignoring, forgetting isn't the same thing as forgiving. So I, when I preached on this in the past, I've, I've kind of always, I went back to, and I still continue to go back to this idea of forgiveness is committing yourself to a relationship going forward. Um, recognizing there are things in the past, not holding those against somebody as a way of gaining power over them, but of negotiating what it means to move forward in relationship, of staying committed to a relationship. Um, and that relationship might look really different from a previous, what that relationship was previously, but it's, it's future oriented as opposed to past oriented. And it's also something that rarely happens just once and for all, like, I thought about this and I've done the work and today I forgive you. Uh, for a lot of us, it's, there, it's a more of a process, right? That's ongoing. Well, that's what, that's what uh, I think the one aspect of the commentary that was helpful that, uh, that seven or 70 times, uh, 77 times suggests that forgiveness may well be a long and difficult process rather than a week long project. Uh, and so there's, there's kind of, uh, I'm, I'm finding what's interesting to me is sort of the before and after of that act of forgiveness. You know, um, when are you really, really ready to forgive? And so you say, I forgive you. Um, or when do you say, I forgive you and sort of live, live into or lean into that reality of what that, what that looks like, recognizing that that forgiveness is not, is not automatic in that moment, but is, is like you said, Matt, more of a commitment to, this is what I'm commi committing myself to uh, and I'm moving forward in that. And so that, that sort of length and a length of time and process rather than numbers of time, uh, numbers of times I think is a helpful, I think could be a helpful way to, to think about it as well. Yeah, I started the um, conversation with, uh, with the joke about uh, a non-existent app that counts sins as if, as if the point, to highlight the point that it isn't that once you get to 77, then you quit. But right, I mean, it seems to me Jesus' point, and there's a lot of hyper, there's hyperbole throughout this passage, both in the parable and in the direct um, teaching moments, is that forgiveness is a necessary part of ongoing communal relationship. It's if another member of the church sins against me, right? I mean, that, that's the issue. So a member of your community, and basically the point is, it's going to require ongoing forgiveness. I mean, the the, the number one thing that makes a marriage uh, be able to work or, or a family with uh, between siblings or between parents and children work is um, the ongoing forgiveness. Because as you said, I mean, Matt, the point of forgiveness is that the past will not control the future and that there's a different future now possible if forgiveness becomes a regular part of a community's life, which is why I, I liked the practice my, I grew up with and a lot of congregations are moving away from it, uh, but that I like the practice of beginning the worship service with confession and forgiveness so that now, with re and then also having the passing of the peace, which is forgiveness and reconciliation. You know, it's a ritual of reconciliation and forgiveness between people so that t twice in the service, we're reminded that um, the, 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 the baseline that makes our community possible and a future possible is a commitment to ongoing forgiveness. Well, and I'm passing the peace for a long time. <laughs> because your hands are so filthy with I will say it, but I'm not, I'm not touching any of you for a long time. I don't like it when you touch me anyway. All right. Sorry, Caroline, you were gonna say something actually useful. I, I was going to connect us to Genesis 50. Oh, please do. Let's do it. Uh, which is, uh, you know, the the reason there are the reasons for that connection are are pretty clear, uh, and I think we've talked about this before. Does does the you know does this yoking of of Matthew eighteen and Genesis uh, help the situation or convolute it uh, in terms of in terms of how we think about forgiveness and 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 how we you know how we think about uh, Joseph and his relationship with his brothers? So where do you find yourself uh, three years later in this? Sorry for trafficking you into slavery, Joseph. It was Zebulun's idea. Yeah, um, yeah I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's an it's a inspiring story of an incredible um, capacity to forgive 
but let's not pretend that, that means that forgiveness is easy. See what I mean? I mean, as a model, it's a, it serves as an ideal. But if it becomes, uh, hey, Joseph was able to forgive, why can't you get over it, pal? Uh, then it's, you know what I mean? We need to fill in the story with something that respects the, the pain that a heinous act like that obviously would have inflicted upon Joseph, upon Jacob, upon others as well. I, you know, because, because of the state of biblical illiteracy, I think we have to recognize that a lot of people won't know where in the story they're dropping down here. So if you're going to either preach on Genesis 15 or draw on it as an illustration of forgiveness while preaching on Matthew 18 or just on the broader theme of forgiveness, you're going to need some context. Um, you know, that as Matt, as Matt said, uh, you know, Reuben and Judah, uh, lead the brothers in their actions. Uh, they limit, you know, there's limiting so that they don't murder Joseph, but um, to where they are here. And then the, he's already forgiven them once in the story. It's important to know this is not the moment of forgiveness. They've already been forgiven, but now that their father is dead, their old sins come creeping back into their fear. And they're afraid of their old sins. And what if Joseph still bears a grudge, uh, my translation says, and pays us back in full, right? That is, what would a full repayment uh, without reconciliation be? Um, I think that's great. There's in that, in that narrative, there's just great insight into human nature, which is sometimes when I'm just cruising down the street or old sins of mine will pop back into my head and I feel overwhelmed again with guilt. Um, and um, as one of my teachers said, there, there's no sins Jesus loves forgiving more than old ones. Um, then the story, uh, the, the verse that Matt hates uh, that I love is, even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good. Uh -huh. the, the word intended is in Hebrew can be translated so many different ways. Think to plan to intend or to shape. I mean, that is, it's not that um, God did this back in chapter 37. The brothers did it and what they intended was wrong, but that God can work even through human wrong to bring out good. Where there's been wrong, God can use that and enter in to um, bring about God's will for life. I think I think, first of all, it's my experience. Second of all, I think it's beautiful. Speaking of beautiful, should we talk about the Exodus? I can't wait to hear what you're going to say about, uh, about this. Me? Yeah. Oh, I would say read Michael Chan's commentary, especially the final two paragraphs. But that's, uh, people don't, don't tune into the podcast to hear me just read what Michael Chan says. That Yeah, that there is... I mentioned this last week where I talked about reading ahead, that there's a, this is not just one group of ragtag people being delivered from a foreign army, that there is a bigger mythology at work here. And Michael Chan, again, our, our friend does a really good job pointing out that the victims in this story are not just simply the Israelites and the enslavement they've suffered and the death and the oppression that they've suffered. It's also Pharaoh's own army, right? It's the, it's, it's what happens when a system like Pharaoh's that's all about production or that's all about, Oh, I don't know the, the, what's the word I want. Um, <laughs> the lack of value in human life, all for the sake of magnifying Pharaoh's own greatness, the, pays a price, even among Pharaoh's own supposed allies or his own um, soldiers, even those who might benefit from the system, uh, they become not just, you know, soldiers that are killed, but they themselves are emblematic of domination and violence. Um, 
because they've been the ones charged to or willing to enforce Pharaoh's will. Well, I, and I, yeah, I think that's a really important aspect of this text, and I really appreciated that in the commentary. And um, and it, it's a, it's an important corrective as we think about as we think about this this topic of forgiveness of how how uh, quickly and easily we reduce uh, or we think about how we how we've sinned against someone as an individual act or as a you know as a one on one um, reality, but when in fact the ways in which um, the ways in which we beg for forgiveness as we get caught up in systems that are pharaonic. Uh, that are um, that are caught up in evil and and how is it that we how is it that we recognize the the larger reality of the uh, those larger um, forces of sin that uh, that we have committed uh, ourselves to or that we've gotten sucked up into and how is it that we how is it that we then um, give confession to that and uh, and ask for forgiveness in that so I think that's uh, that's an important aspect, a dynamic of this text as well. Yeah, and it's worth remembering uh, in the Old Testament narrative that um, Israel turns back into Egypt later. Israel develops its own pharaoh. I mean, uh, King Solomon is especially carefully portrayed as a new pharaoh. You know, the law in it's either Deuteronomy 18, I think it's Deuteronomy 18 or 17, the law of the king. You know, when you have a king, they are not to do these things, especially go back to Egypt and get horses, because horses are only good for war. And that and those are the things that exactly Pharaoh does. So that what you guys are talking about is I, I didn't know that was the word pharaonic. Was that uh, your word, Matt or uh, Carolyn? That's Michael's Ph Michael's word. Pharaonic. Um, I was so caught up by his use of chaos kampf. That I that I missed the word pharaonic in his commentary. Ka I prefer pharaoh esque. Ka Ka uh, but uh, our human, uh, our the um, the tenacity of human sin, our inability not to sin, means that our own systems that we create, in place of the Egyptian one, turn right back into that in the end. So we will have to be delivered from ourselves in the end which is, after all, uh, the New Testament narrative. And uh, maybe, maybe a refrain uh, throughout all of this is, comes from the psalm, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, far more than any of us could ever be. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's, that's sort of the, the sub-theme in all of this, right? That it, we as human beings are not capable of that kind of, uh, mercy and graciousness, uh, that kind of um, uh, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That's the contrast here. That's, uh, that's what's being pointed out. So maybe, maybe that's again the way, the way in which the, um, the way in which the psalm could uh, get interwoven with some of the themes that we've talked about. I like the, <clears throat> excuse me, you called it a refrain. Sorry about that. <clears throat> that there's a, um, it's part of this psalm. It's also a consistent statement that's made throughout scripture, which it could be helpful for a sermon to take that and say, look, this is something we're told over and over again, relatively consistently, that this is a characteristic of who God is. Therefore, this is why we bristle at the end of Jesus' parable, right? And kind of think, is this, wait, what's up with this? Uh, this is why we wonder where's the sympathy for the Egyptians? in that passage. You know what I mean? That there's this, that, that part of what's going on through either the brilliance or the accidental, you know, pairing of these texts on this Sunday is a question of how do we interpret Matthew 18, for example, if indeed we believe that God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And then what claim does that make on us as well? So how, I don't know how, I'm not smart enough liturgically or creative enough liturgically to think about how that works. I know you'll say to use it liturgically, but how to make this refrain a, a consistent beat, you know, throughout the entire service <clears throat> that keeps calling us back to, but this is who we believe God is, right? And why do we believe this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I mean, you're, you're right. It is, it's a creed-like fragment introduced in Exodus 34 is probably one of the most ancient revelations 
of Yahweh's character. Uh, uh, we don't get that passage in this uh, this fall, which is a shame. Uh, uh, God's revelation of the name there in Exodus 34 and the meaning of the name. But this is it. This is I mean, this is the fundamental confession of of um, God's character. Um, if you're going to pick up the um, the larger passage passage of the psalm, uh, starting in verse one, it's worth uh, recognizing that the the psalm writer is uh, in a unique bit of Hebrew poetry uh, of poetic. It's a poetic style in Hebrew. The psalm writer is talking. Let's. Uh, uh, to him or herself, bless, praise the Lord, O my soul, and everything that I am, praise his holy name. That is, instead of a call and response to a congregation, it's calling him or herself to praise, the soul to praise, and then the, all that follows. So that it's a, re, it's a reminder even to oneself that the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That's great. Yeah. Uh, we this should finish the up. This Romans, is... But you can cheat if you want. And you could do next week, you could do Romans chapter 15, where Paul says, uh, welcome one another. You could do the week after that, Romans 16, and talk a bit about uh, some of Paul's co-workers and introduce people to, to Junia and others that they might not know anything about. You can, you can keep going. You don't have to stop with Romans. You can skip Philippians these upcoming weeks and, and squeeze a little more <laughs> Romans out. Skip Philippians? Just telling you, you can do it or do both, you know, skip the Old Testament and just do two epistle readings. But anyway, this one is a, um, <clears throat> opens up a larger conversation that, that is, runs throughout chapter 14 and in some ways gets, uh, reaches its climax in the beginning of chapter 15 when Paul says uh, to welcome one another, which is how this passage opens, welcome those who are weak in faith. I, you know, this is about dietary preferences. There could be some class distinctions and some cultural or ethnic distinctions taking place in this passage too, but it's an interesting passage for me to read during a time when the church is just as polarized as any other, I don't know, group or, or arena in the United States right now where we live uh, as any other one, right? Especially moving into um, a national election in what, six weeks or so? Um, it's an interesting, you know, who are you to pass judgment servants of another? It's before their own Lord, they stand or fall. I spend a lot of time worrying about whether or not I'm really part of the same religious family as some other people who take the name Christian uh, and texts like this pull me back and, and remind me that um, I can fight for what I believe, but some of those judgments aren't ultimately mine to make. Or are they? Caroline, Rolf. I think we should end it there. Can we oh, do that? come on, there's a sense of, yeah. You don't wanna talk about forbearance? Uh, um, you don't wanna talk about conscience, my Lutheran friends? It's a great, the, I like the, I like the, the, um, some believe in eating anything while the weak eat only vegetables. I think that we should just preach on that. <laughs> and then, but it is true about the, the uh, absolute, even, even just like about what people choose to eat or not eat, the self-righteousness that that lifestyle choice evokes, right? There, is anybody more judgmental than uh, certain people uh, who've adopted certain aggressive uh, diets? And uh, there's so many of them that I won't even... Uh, I don't have to use specific examples, which is good because I'd be offending somebody. But you know that uh, it is I think sort you of. You might have already done that. You think so? <laughs> yeah. Well, I do. I mean, just just by mentioning that much. <laughs> oh, what is it? Uh, I can't remember. Is it uh, somebody says uh, vegans the um, Hezbollah faction of the uh, vegetarians? That was Anthony Bourdain of blessed memory. Uh, made that joke, but you know that is the sort of aggressive self righteousness. But then, I, but then you're right. I like the call. Well, you know, who are we to judge? Why? Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Why do you despise? For we will all stand before the judgment seat. But here's what I really love about this passage. Um, first of all, there's a, I mean, just the great funeral passage, 
we do not live to ourselves. We do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord's. So whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. I mean, I think that's worth um, uh, holding up uh, just as a beautiful statement of the gospel. And I think one, one last thing about the, uh, you know, why do you despise your brother or sister if we all stand before the judgment seat of God? And then, and then verse 12, so then each of us will be accountable to God. In between that, sandwiched in between that, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God, which calls attention to the fact that in our judgment, what are we doing? Are we praising God? Uh, it, it, it's a, I think it's a really important way to cast light on that act of judgment and that, that act of judgment is not just, uh, not just an act against, uh, against your neighbor uh, and is not yours to do, but actually um, is how you, how you yourself stand uh, in terms of your relationship with God and whether that's an act of praise of God or not, I think it would be worth thinking about.